Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar. We'll be getting started in just a few minutes. Um, in the meantime, let me just give you a quick update on our upcoming next upcoming webinar, which will be on Thursday, October 15th. We'll have a panel discussion then to talk about the medical end use uh, for semiconductors and the important role semiconductors have played during uh, the current uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So um, please look in, look out for that notice about the upcoming webinar on medical end use for semiconductors. Uh, Thursday, October 15th, likely time will be 1 p.m. Eastern. But let's turn our attention to today's topic at hand. Um, my name is Falan Yanug. I'm the Director of Industry Statistics and Economic Policy at the Semiconductor Industry Association. Uh, today's topic is Trends and Challenges in Semiconductor Advanced Packaging. As you all know, innovations in semiconductors are pack uh, innovations in how semiconductors are packaged have enabled the global semiconductor industry to achieve additional advances on top of those that we normally and traditionally uh, know about during the front end manufacturing process. Many packaging technologies exist today and selecting the right one is no longer simply an afterthought but an integral part of semiconductor manufacturing. For semiconductor firms known as OSATs, that's, that specialize in the back end assembly test and packaging, the current environment poses both unique challenges and opportunities. Today to discuss these unique challenges and opportunities, we have a distinguished panel of three uh, speakers. Uh, Guillaume Asogba, uh, PhD, is an economist at Yol Development. Uh, he is uh, focused on consumer transport, defense and aeronautic, medical and industrial markets. Um, this involves collecting and analyzing large amounts of information on economic spheres. He will provide an overview of how our current uh, global pandemic environment has impacted the industry and our economy uh, and um, the back end functioning as well. Next, we'll have a presentation of these challenges and opportunities in this space from John Stone, Executive Vice President and Chief Sales Officer for Worldwide Sales and Marketing for Amcor Technology. Uh, John, has served, uh, John has more than 30 years of semiconductor industry experience in engineering, engineering management, sales management. Uh, and, and prior to Amcor, uh, John held executive and management positions with uh, Chip. Uh, Chippack, Kyocera America, Sumitomo America, and General Electric. So we have a lot of um, good experience and knowledge uh, being brought to our seminar today. So why don't we go ahead and get started um, with you, Guillaume, uh, uh, to give us a, a, an overview of, of, of how this uh, pandemic has uh, impacted our global economy and uh, the industry as well. Uh, thank you, Falan, for our introduction. And I would also like to thank SCA for organization and audience for joining. So today, almost each economist in the world agreed to say that we are facing an, an unprecedented economic situation crisis. And this situation is a result of conjunction of three main factors. First, the COVID-19 global pandemic. Second, the trade war between US and China and third, the price we had earlier this year about price of oil between Saudi Arabia and Russia. So these three factors lead us to current situation where we saw a drastic fall of GDP uh, in many countries. And technically, what you, you are seeing in this slide is that is the fact that we have at the same time a supply shock and a demand shock. This shock was caused because um, many countries decided to shut down partially or totally their activities, their economies, and to and to and to prevent people uh, to get the virus, to get infected by, by, by the, the virus. So the main point here is that. We move to an initial from an initial equilibrium point E to a new equilibrium point E third. By this move, we lost uh, consumer surplus and producer surplus, and the sum of both surplus is the generated wealth. So this is why we have 
a drastic fall of GDP because we have a reduction of generated wealth caused by the simultaneous loss of surplus of, from consumer and producer. So even if in global economy uh, we have a bad effect, we can see some disparities if we look at uh, each market uh, separately. For example, at Yale, we monitor six end markets, automotive and mobility, industrial, mobile and consumer, telecom and infrastructure, medical, defense and aerospace. If I take example of automotive and mobility, both civil aviation and automotive will be strongly and negatively durably impacted by COVID-19. At all, we expect a global, global automotive market uh, to fall by 20% this year, while at the same time, the electrical part of this market, thanks to stimulus, will strongly grow. If I take defense and aerospace example, we don't believe that global budget expense will uh, be strongly negative impact. Indeed, even if in some countries there will be a slight reduction in uh, defense budget, in many countries there will be a little augmentation, a little increase. For example, in France, uh, French government uh, passed uh, an anticipated orders you know, to support this defense industry. Also, we have SpaceX uh, who continues to work on space exploration. So now if we have a look about semiconductor technology, here you have a snapshot of components in semiconductor we monitor at Yale, and you have a pre-COVID-19 2020 forecast. So you have shipment in million units and market value. We try to impact, to, to estimate the impact of COVID-19 on this component. So here you can see that few of them will be negatively impacted by COVID. And for those that will be negatively impacted by, by COVID, related to automotive market, for example, sensing and computing for radars, I add in automotive and radar. But in the same time, we have, for example, thermal detectors and thermal imagers that will be positive impact because we need them to take the temperature or to monitor fever about people. And we have also memories and silicon photonics that will increase because of increase of data we have to process from homework office or recreational use as streaming or cloud gaming. And talking about cloud gaming, cloud gaming will also greatly positively impact because people work from home, people uh, must, stay, uh, must stay at home. So people try to, to spend time by playing or, or so on. So this, is, this was a little uh, snapshot about uh, COVID-19 impact on, uh, on some semiconductor components we monitor at Yale. And now I will let uh, Santosh talk you more about current trends and challenges in advanced packaging. So thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Guillaume. Um, one quick follow-up question, if, you, if I may add. Um, uh, before we get on to Santosh, uh, Santosh's presentation, uh, from your point of view, is there any aspect of the global economy in general or the semiconductor industry in particular um, that you think will be permanently altered uh, by the pandemic? We've lived in these unprecedented times over the past year, and a lot of folks are, have speculated, what, what, what's the world going to look like post-pandemic, whenever that is, right? And so in terms of from your point of view in terms of the overall economy, um, but also in terms of your thoughts on specifically the semiconductor industry, are there anything, any, any thoughts that you can provide on how, how we may be looking different when we come out of this? 
Uh, thanks. That's a good question. <laughs> Difficult to, to to give you one answer. But what I what I could say is that in, for global economy, we have effect that will last maybe two, three, or five years. Uh, but it's it's for sensory. It's difficult to 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 tell you which kind of effect will last or which kind will have. What we know is that uh, we will will have great recession this year. But from 2021, maybe we have new growth of GDP. But if we look at semiconductor uh, industry, for example. We do not think that uh, we we have permanently uh, permanently permanently bad effects because new technology are coming. For example, we have 5G, robotic vehicle, electrification, and those technology will drive new development and increase volume of semiconductor components. So we, we don't believe that uh, we, we believe that there will be bad effects, but we believe that these bad effects will last maybe two or three years for, for example, for automotive and for civil aviation. Unfortunately, this bad effect could last maybe uh, at least five years. Mm. Thanks for that. Yeah, I think uh, from what I've heard as well, some, some of the the impacts on of the pandemic have actually helped accelerated some of the technologies and, yeah. and sort of innovations that were eventually going to be coming um, down the pike, but uh, have um, been needed to be accelerated and necessitated that you've described. So yeah, thanks. Exactly. Um, now, Santosh Kumar, turning to you, um, can you give us a, a more of a deeper dive into what the challenges and opp opportunities uh, lie for us in, in this particular advanced packaging space? Okay, so first of all, I'd like to thank uh, SIA for uh, giving uh, me the opportunity to speak on this topic and uh, thanks Guillaume for your presentation. So I am going to talk about the advanced packaging, you know, like the current uh, trend and the challenges. And uh, so first of all, you know, like uh, I want to discuss about the advanced packaging platform, like classification at the different system level. So first we have, you know, like the packaging at the dye level or vapor level, we can say, where we have, you know, like the fan in WLP and fan out WLP. And also we have, you know, like 2.5D, 3D. And here we have the, in terms of interconnection, we have, you know, like the TGV or, or TSV through silicon via glass via bump pillar or, you know, like the silicon bridge or the glass bridge. And then, you know, like uh, at the same time at, you know, like we have at the substrate and the strip level, which, uh, is mainly the panel based and then we have the panel level nowadays especially we we call it for the fan out plp technology and here it's you know the rdl is the is the interconnect over there and at the substrate level we have you know like the the flip chip interconnect or the wire bond kind of interconnect but here for the advanced packaging we are mainly considering the flip chip kind of interconnect and here we have the strong standard you know like organic substrate so it can be you know like the advanced organic substrate or organic interposer or mold Im embedding like kind of the molded interconnect substrate MIS, and then we have the ceramic and lead frame and others. And here we have, you know, like for example, for the organic substrate, we have the flip chip, uh, so flip chip CSP and the flip chip BGA standard and the BGA advanced and the, the flip chip SG kind of the package. And then also we have the wire bond, you know, like uh, based on different uh, the substrate technology. And then in the, you know, like at the panel level, we also have the embedded dye in the laminate and uh, then also at another level, we have, you know, like system in package, package and package and everything. So what we consider here, the advanced packaging platform is the vapor level packaging, fan in, fan out, 2.5D, 3D and, and the flip chip and embedded dye. So this is the advanced packaging uh, market share evolution since 2014. So if you see, you know, like in 2014, total packaging market uh, was around $53 billion and advanced packaging was around 38% of that market. And, but as we, you know, like uh, went forward, so we see, you know, like currently in 2019, our, you know, like the, the market share of the advanced packaging is, is around, you know, like the 43% and uh, the other rest of the packaging is 57%. And as we move to around 2025, we see that the percentage of the, the, the revenue for this advanced packaging is already, you know, like catching with the traditional packaging technologies over here and in terms of the growth we see that the total packaging is you know like in from 2019 to 2025 uh, time frame is growing at 4% CAGR while uh, the 
the traditional packaging will grow at 2% and the advanced packaging we see it's growing at you know like 7%. So in terms of the growth rate, we see advanced packaging is almost you know like more than three times that of the traditional packaging technology. So it's you know like becoming very, very important over here. And now if we go to the advanced packaging revenue split by the packaging platform, so you can see, you know, like in 2019, so flip chip or, you know, like the flip chip based, you know, like the different packaging technology is still, you know, like has 83%, you know, like market share. It's around, you know, like 24 billion market uh, in 2009. And then we have uh, second is the fan in, it's around 7%. And then the fan out is the 5%. And then we have the 3D stack packaging that is the the five percent and embedded dye is you know like it's, it's still very very strong very very small so it's you know like uh, less than 0 0.5 percent around 55 million dollar but when we go to 2025 we see you know like the which technologies you know like taking the more and more market we see the fan out it's increasing from five percent to seven percent and then we have you know like the 3d stack technology that is you know like almost doubling its market share and embedded dye is also increasing its market share and fanin is more or less, you know, like kind of the stable and flip chip will go to 77%. And in terms of the growth rate, if we see, so flip chip will grow at around 6%, fan out will grow at around 16% and fanin WLP 3.2%, 3D stacking is 21% and the embedded dye is 18%. So especially if we talk about, you know, like the, the 3D stacking technology, so they are mainly, you know, like uh, for this uh, AI machine learning, uh, high performance computing data centers. And also we know, you know, like this uh, uh, 3D stacking is also used in CMOS image sensor. So now we have, you know, like the three three die stacked the image sensor. We have the DRAM and the sensor die as well as the ASIC die installed it in there. That is also one of the big driver for this 3D stacking. And for the fan out is, you know, like, of course, mobile is, you know, like one of the key drivers in there, but we also see, you know, like the fan out, you know, like the, going to the networking and you know like the high performance computing and those areas and also the antenna in package these are the some you know like the areas where we see also the fan out you know like growing growing more and more further fan in is still you know like mainly dominated by the mobile and more than 90 percent uh, you know like uh, uh, application is is in the mobile for the fan in so in the fan in what we are seeing is that you know like even though the mobile growth is kind of you know like uh, a kind of stable growth, steady growth, not so much high, but the number of the fan in packages inside the mobile that is increasing. And this is the technology roadmap from, you know, like the nano scale, we can say from the foundry to the packaging. And it's, you know, like the good way to, you know, kind of see the, the correlation between the, the, the node where the advanced node is going and what are, you know, like the, the technology trend of the advanced packaging. So first thing we see, you know, like now we have only three players, you can see over there, Intel, Samsung, and the TSMC who are, you know, like uh, uh, manufacturing silicon at the advanced load. And in there, you know, like TSMC is, you know, like really having the lead, lead, over there, lead over there. So now we will see this year, they are, you know, like going into the five nanometer production. And Intel has some, you know, like issue with the 10 nanometer, we will see they will catch up with further. And now currently they have, you know, like outsourced some of their, you know, like uh, the vapor manufacturing to the, to the TSMC. And, Global Foundry, they stopped at 14 nanometer, no more further, you know, like they are going. And for the, now if we go to the advanced packaging, so for the stack die, so bump pitch, micro bump pitch. So currently we are seeing, you know, like the bump pitch around, you know, like 40, 45 micro, micrometer. And we will see in, in coming to next two years, it will go to, you know, the 20, around 20 micro micrometer. And, you know, like up to more further, like after 2023, we, we see that it will go to, you know, like 20 to even 10 micron over there. And mainly facilitated by facilitated by you know like here the, the hybrid bonding, and for the die to substrate you know like the flip chip bump pitch currently it's in the range of you know like 80 micron to 150 micron that is also you know like going down so we will see it's going to you know like 50 micron and, and more than in the coming years for the substrate to board BGA ball pitch so mainly currently it's 350 micron micrometer and the 400 micrometer, and uh, we are seeing it's going to you know like 300 micrometer in the future. So here, you know, like there is two thing, uh, uh, two message I want to give. Industry is, you know, like looking into the, the growing importance of this functional load map and advanced packaging is, is very essential to, you know, like bridge the scaling gap between the between the die front end and, you know, like the PCB. And 
if we see the advanced packaging, you know, like the, the vapor is played by the manufacturers, like who are, you know, like the key manufacturers in this, the advanced packaging. So we see, we see here, you know, around the 10 players, they control almost you know, like 75% of the advanced packaging, packaging vapors. So in the 10 players, we have the two IDMs, we have Intel and Samsung and one foundry TSMC. And then we have the top five global OSATs. So we have the ASE, m PTI, JSET, and ASE in skill is now, you know, combined. Together with, you know, like the NEPES and the chip bond, they control almost three by fourth of the vapor in there. In terms of the, the you know, like the leader, we see, you know, like the TSMC is 14% followed by the Samsung. Then we have, you know, like the AC, Steel, Intel, and Amcor, and so on. And this is the financial overview of the top 25 OSATs, and that is based on the revenue in 2019. So we see, you know, like uh, in, in the top, top, you know, like, uh, five, we can see, you know, like there are uh, two players from the China. And if we say the top six, then we have the three players from the China. We have, you know, like the Jesset Group, Tongfu, and the and Tian Huatian Microelectronics. And uh, for the TSMC, currently on the basis of their revenue in 2019, so they are, they ranked between, you know, like three, three to four. They have around, you know, like 2.8 billion revenue last year over there. And uh, so, if you look at you know like all those companies so there is you know like clearly you you can see you know like kind of the divide between the revenues you know like between the top seven eight and the rest of that and the rest of the players you know like because of this you know like huge discrepancy in the revenue so they need to catch up you know like uh, with the you know like kind of you know like more and more technology development more and more you know like kind of uh, uh, putting more effort into it otherwise you know like you will see more and more merger acquisitions in 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 that area or, you know, like maybe, you know, like they will end up, you know, like being going out of the business. And, and top of that, you know, like they are really creating a disparity. They were, they were investing, you know, like very hugely in this R&D and, you know, are maintaining, you know, like the lead in this area. And this is the semiconductor supply chain uh, in 2020. So here you can see, you know, like, so we have, you know, like the design of chip package and the module. So here we have, you know, like, for example, the fabulous players. And so they are mainly in this design of chip and package. And then we have the IDMs who control, you know, like from the design up to the, the package assembly and the final test. And then we have, you know, like the, some satellite players. So they outsource some of the manufacturing, but uh, focus mainly on the critical IP in the manufacturing. And then we have the, the vapor foundries, for example, you know, like the global foundries of TSMC or SMIC. And then we have, you know, like the integrated vapor package manufacturing form bridge, uh, where they, you know, like not only involve in the in the, the silicon front end, but they are also in the, you know, like the middle end and in the packaging assembly and test. And TSC, TSMC is one of the good good example of that. And then we have the vapor level packaging houses and and the OSATs. And some of the OSATs we see they also have the AMS capability. So like for example, we see the AAC. So AAC, you know, like so they have also the EMS. Uh, capability with their USI, you know, like the partner. And then uh, we have some of the, 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 those sets who are just the vapor bumping, you know, like mainly, mainly doing the vapor level packaging or vapor bumping, not go to, you know, like the further mm -hmm. kind of the assembly. Like for example, we have the, the LB Semicon or Nepes in here. And uh, then we have, you know, like some of the PCB houses, they are, you know, like they have the embedded die capability. And then we see uh, the, the some of the you know like the odm or ems players so they are you know like not only going to you know like integrate in the left but also you know like the downstream and also in the upstream like for example one good example i can give you of the of the foxconn so they acquired you know like the sarp so they kind of become also kind of oem over there and uh, so and then we have the oem so who also you know like involved in the sub module sub design assembly and that then other than that, we have the other players like equipment players and you know like other players, uh, material players supporting this the, the whole whole the semiconductor manufacturing supply chain. And if you see, you know, like there is, you know, like this is very dynamic, you know, supply chain, and there is a lot of mobility across the at, at various levels. So you know, like in, in order to expand their business and to explore the new areas, so they are, you know, like moving to the different uh, business models. So now there is no clear cut distinction over there. So we are seeing, you know, like the OEMs, is, uh, like, you know, like uh, we can say the software or, you know, the, the service, uh, the internet players like Microsoft, Google, or uh, the, the, even the, the automotive players, they are also, you know, like going into the IC design and, and the packaging. And in there, they not only, you know, like control uh, only the design, but they control the supply chain of even the packaging up to the, you know, like the PCB, PCB level over there. And 
then we have you know like some of the IBMs who try to enter into the foundries. Foundries are you know like going into the developing their you know like the the, the packaging, especially the vapor level packaging. We see the TSMC one of the various active player in this, and then we have the UMC, XMC, Smith. They are also you know like going into this. And then OSATs, OSATs are also, you know, like developing more and more, you know, like the vapor level fund, uh, packaging technology, the fan out packaging technology. They are adding a lot of testing, testing capability over there. So testing is also, you know, like one of the big part of the business. So we have, you know, like some of the, the players like uh, KYEC and Sigur, they are, you know, like exclusive testing house. So some of them, you know, like OSATs, they are also, you know, like getting, try to get their business over there. And then the substrate suppliers, they are, you know, like moving into the, you know, like the, the PCB, especially for the substrate like PCB, especially we have seen in the mobile, it's that kind of PCB is morely mainly, you know, like using the MSAP process mainly used in the substrate. So they are also going into that. PCB suppliers, they are also, you know, like improving their technology and try to get into the, the, the you know, like the package substrate because there is, you know, like a good margin over there. And then we also see, you know, like the EMS players, you know, like coming into the, the different, you know, like the packaging and others. And so there is, you know, like a lot of different things, you know, like going over there. And if we especially focus on those SATs packaging, you know, like the business. So traditionally, you know, like the packaging was, you know, like uh, mainly outsourced packaging was mainly, you know, like dominated by the OSATs. And then now we are seeing that, you know, especially in the traditional packaging, we are seeing, you know, like the players like the Foxconn or DMS or, you know, like JBL, they are, you know, like also developing, coming into this, this uh, traditional packaging market. And, uh, and then from that, in the advanced packaging, especially we see, you know, like the, the, the foundries, like the TSMC, UMC, XMC, they are coming into this advanced packaging, you know, like the market and they are taking some of the sale. And then there is the substrate suppliers or PCB suppliers. We have, you know, like the ATNS or Unimicron or Semco. They are also developing uh, the advanced packaging capability in here. And especially substrate supplier, you know, like since we have, you know, like this uh, more and more increase of the fan out business. So they, lo they lose the, you know, like the substrate business. So in order to, you know, like gain more and more uh, into this advanced packaging market, they are, you know, like developing the, even the assembly technology over there. So that's, you know, like in a summary way, you know, like kind of cannibalizing those ads market. And uh, so with this, um, I finish my presentation. Thank you, Santosh. This has uh, been uh, quite a quite a fascinating presentation, a lot of information. And I do want to follow up with you uh, in particular about the mobility across the semiconductor supply chain, which I think is, is very interesting development. But before we do that, I want to go ahead and move on to uh, John Stone uh, because um, I want to be sure we have time for all the presentations before we jump into the Q&A. So why don't we go ahead um, and uh, so please remind me, Santosh, at that Q&A to be sure to uh, follow up with you on that question. But Currently, let's go ahead and um, move over to our, our third and final presentation uh, by John Stone, um, uh, who, will, who will give us an industry point of view, uh, a company point of view on what is going on in terms of the challenges and opportunities in uh, advanced packaging. So um, John, let me turn it over to you. Okay, good morning, everyone. Can you see that okay? Yep. Okay, great. Okay, good morning. Um, Fallon, thank you for inviting me to participate in the panel today. Appreciate the opportunity. I'm going to talk about Amcor's view on the trends and challenges in uh, advanced packaging. So a little bit different um, view than uh, Santosh had um, as a uh, as an OSAT. Okay, my screen is frozen. Hang on a second. Okay. There you go. Can you see that okay? Yep. All right, great. All right, I'll start with a quick introduction uh, on Amcor for those of you that may not know who we are. Then I'll talk about the advanced packaging trends from our perspective and um, more importantly, the opportunities that we're seeing. And then I'll finish up with uh, advanced packaging challenges. So it's going to take me about 15 minutes to get through this. Uh, Amcor is a, a an outsourced assembly and test or OSAT uh, supplier in the semiconductor industry. We're actually the second largest OSAT in the world. Uh, we're the only tier one OSAT that's headquartered uh, in the US. So let me walk through a few slides to uh, give you an overview on Amcor. 
So Amcor, by the numbers, we were founded in 1968. Uh, we actually pioneered the OSAT uh, model. We, we began that model uh, over 50 years ago. 2019, we did uh, 4.1 billion in sales. We have over 30,000 employees worldwide. Um, we spent about 475 million in CapEx in 2019. We have 11 million square feet of manufacturing space, uh, a footprint in 11 different countries. And we service uh, all of the end markets in the semiconductor industry. And I'll talk about those a little bit more as we go through this. If you look at uh, Amcor or OSATs in the supply chain, uh, we're in kind of a unique position there. We, um, we receive the wafers from the fab. Uh, we dice those into individual ICs, and then we package them in what can be tens of thousands of different packaging configurations, depending on the end application. Uh, many times we'll perform a, an electrical test and then we'll ship those parts onto the EMS house where they'll mount that on a PC board before it goes into the final system whether that be a PC or an automobile or a um, phone or anything else uh, using a semiconductor. Um, Santos pointed out that the wafer fabs and the EMS guys are starting to do uh, some of the back end work as well. Uh, and we agree there is a certain amount of the TAM being cannibalized there, but we have a little bit different view on that. Um, we really see the markets that they're getting into are really new pieces of TAM uh, that's available to, uh, to the entire packaging uh, market, whether it be OSATs, FABs, or EMS. So on the FAB side, you know, they're, they're getting into the high density fan out, 2.5, 3D, uh, highly integrated packages. But the OSATs are also participating in that new TAM that is beginning to grow, particularly uh, in the data centers. On the, uh, on the EMS side, uh, the EMS guys are beginning to do SIP, uh, but the SIP market is growing uh, significantly uh, in mobile and uh, other markets, and that's benefiting the OSATs as well. So even though uh, these two players are, are entering more into package, the overall packaging market and the opportunities are growing, and that's good for uh, all OSATs. So Amcor's uh, manufacturing footprint, we have 21 factories in seven countries uh, that make up our 11 million square feet. Uh, Korea, Taiwan, and Portugal are really our high-end high, uh, ad, high advanced factory sites. Uh, Japan, Shanghai, uh, Philippines, and Malaysia do more of our mainstream packaging. I thought I'd show you what an OSAT factory looks like. This is our Latest factory in Incheon, Korea, outside of Seoul. Um, we call this K5. It's our most uh, recent factory. So big place, 2.3 million square feet under roof. Uh, it sits on 46 acres of land. Um, it's a little over 6,000 employees in this site now. That will go up as we continue to facilitate it. It's not uh, totally facilitized inside yet. Uh, we still have room to grow. Uh, we did locate our state-of-the-art R&D center here. So our R&D guys are, are based there. And this factory only does advanced packaging. So a lot of automation, a lot of robots, uh, very, very um, uh, good particle control in the clean rooms. Um, it's a green building. You can see some uh, solar panels on the top there that are used to provide some of the uh, electrical power in our office areas. Uh, we make our own nitrogen on site. Uh, we recycle our water on site um, and a lot of other green features uh, to this building. Okay, so that's really the overall view of Amcor. Let me move on now to packaging trends and what we see uh, in that area. So there's a number of growth catalysts right now in the semiconductor industry. Uh, I'm gonna talk about four of these that I think are really the, the major drivers uh, for semiconductors and package technology. Uh, 5G, we all know that is um, you know, really ramping right now and that's affecting uh, really anything that's connected um, to provide higher data rates. Automotive, as we move more into autonomous driving and better safety systems is a big driver for semiconductors. Of course, IoT, uh, everything is becoming smart and connected. So everything is going to have a semiconductor and, uh, and a package in it soon. 
and then networking, um, particularly during COVID, uh, a huge boom in uh, data centers uh, and uh, data analytics, and of course, um, uh, the artificial intelligence uh, that is beginning to be um, entered into those markets as well. So those are the big drivers. I'm gonna kind of unpack this slide a little bit and talk about each one in a little bit more detail and how that affects packaging. So the smartphone, um, is really the, the biggest uh, market that's being affected by 5G right now. And smartphones have really been driving package technology for over 10 years uh, because of the requirements on size and performance. So we have to continue to find smaller and smaller uh, footprints, um, reducing height, uh, mainly because the smartphone guys wanna maximize their battery size and battery life. So the packages for all of the semiconductors that go into smartphones have to get smaller and smaller. This created a, a huge boom in wafer level packaging over the last 10 years. Uh, we've developed a lot of sophisticated 3D structures uh, to uh, stack dies together. A lot of multi-die packages going into system and package now in, uh, in a lot of the RF front end applications. Um, and different ways to maintain uh, really good signal integrity because of the uh, RF aspects uh, in the phone. So a lot of challenges in the phone. Uh, those are going to get even more challenging as we move into uh, 5G because 5G actually is going to require more semiconductor content. So there's more pressure to reduce package size and not uh, shrink that battery. We look at the car, the car is a, a major driver right now for new uh, semiconductors and packages. Uh, Amcor is the world's largest OSAP in the automotive industry. Um, we've been uh, in automotive for over 40 years now, but most of that's been in the wire bond packages and the traditional parts of the car that have used semiconductors, body electronics and chassis powertrain. Um, but as we see uh, the new features uh, coming into cars like infotainment, uh, ADAS, uh, electrification, and a lot of the new safety systems, uh, they're beginning to adopt advanced packaging. Uh, and they're adopting those packages much faster than they brought on any new packages uh, in the past um, because they want to bring these features to the market as quickly as possible. So the environment in automotive is changing um, as far as time to market requirements. Uh, although the quality and reliability requirements have not reduced uh, at all. So uh, those um, requirements are still there. We have to meet those, but we also have to be um, fast time to market and provide the package configurations uh, that the automobile uh, guys want to put in the cars. IoT uh, really exploding as far as number of units and IoT really affects every market, consumer, commercial, industrial. Uh, it uses multiple applications. So uh, typical IoT function will have some kind of connectivity, uh, some kind of sensing, uh, usually some computing and, and oftentimes storage. Uh, we'll package those either individually or we might put um, multiple applications in one package in some kind of system and package uh, for the IoT application. A lot of different requirements depending on where the IoT um, uh, device is going to go. Uh, very different if it's in a, uh, a tractor in the field versus uh, an automobile um, versus um, some kind of communication device or a wearable um, with respect to the features that are required. And then um, scale is what IoT is really all about as everything becomes connected. Uh, the, uh, the amount of devices going into this market is is tremendous. Um, we are currently shipping billions of IoT devices per year, and, and that number is only going to go up in the future. Looking at big data real quick, of course, a major driver there is data rates continue to go up. Um, that's putting a lot of um, uh, challenge to the packaging market as we try to learn about thermal management materials and how to deploy those into packaging. Um, better signal integrity for high speed switches, more system and package, uh, large body flip chip BGAs. Um, this is all going into data center networking. And then uh, the storage is also uh, going up uh, along with these, um, these applications. So more uh, die stacking, memory modules, things like that. So a lot of new packages being developed right now, 
big data, I think, is one of the biggest drivers for uh, new package technology, certainly on the high end uh, when you get into some of the advanced uh, fan out technologies. So those are the market drivers um, that we see for semis and, and particularly for advanced packaging right now. Let me move over now to uh, some of the challenges that these new applications are presenting uh, to uh, OSATs and package market in general. So just to level set a little bit, um, advanced packaging is a term uh, used to describe a lot of different package configurations. Um, we kind of break those at Amcor, we break those into these five segments. So there's chip scale and fan out that can um, uh, be used of in small applications. This is a wafer level technology. There's MEMS uh, for sensors primarily. Those can be in a laminate lead frame or wafer based uh, substrate um, flip chip, um, primarily using advanced laminates. Heterogeneous uh, integration that's using silicon interposers and advanced um, RDL technologies for um, uh, multi-chip applications. And then system in a package, uh, really um, a, a big part of the growth right now. This uses very advanced substrate design rules, um, very advanced interconnect technologies, and a lot of uh, unique uh, assembly techniques to get the most amount of, uh, of uh, individual devices into a particular package. So those five are really uh, the drivers of all advanced packaging in, in some way or another. I'm not gonna go through all these, but let me break one or two out here. Uh, let's look at MEMS real quick. I mean, MEMS sounds kind of simple. It's just a sensor and a package. Um, but as I said, it can be in a, a laminate lead frame or, or a wafer configuration. Um, MEMS is being deployed all over the place right now because of the number of sensors going into the world and phones, cars, uh, wearables, um, everything else. Um, we take a, a platform and then uh, look at uh, how many different stimuli need to be put into that package. Uh, we're putting multiple sensors now into packages. We call that fusion MEMS. Uh, that might include accelerometers, uh, gyroscopes, magnetometers, uh, pressure sensors. All of that can now be in one package. And as you can see from the, uh, the image here, it really creates a unique um, uh, challenge as far as how do we connect those uh, into the substrate and then uh, ultimately into the system. So MEMS is driving a lot of new technology, um, continuing to grow in units and uh, for us, it's a, a very strategic part of the market. If we kind of go a little bit more complex, as another example, some of the things we're doing in 3D uh, and 5G are requiring um, very advanced uh, solutions. So starting over kind of on the left, uh, the multi-die and package stacking, we're, we're actually putting two packages together, oftentimes a multi-die in each package. Uh, antenna and package is becoming um, a big requirement now for 5G and cell phones. Um, advanced system integration or SIPs there at the bottom in the middle. So now we're beginning to put literally hundreds of devices uh, onto a small substrate and then packaging it as one device. Um, partial mold, partial shield uh, are packaging techniques that are now being deployed into the market. Uh, compartmental uh, and conformal shielding uh, Dual-sided molding now is coming into um, RF front-end systems, and then uh, embedded die packaging and, and multi-level. So all of these are, are really uh, driving a lot of innovation in advanced packaging and really challenging us to come up with uh, new solutions uh, for a lot of different applications. So to get to all these, obviously, it requires a lot of R&D. And... Um, Amcor is, I think, well positioned here. We're uh, considered a technology leader in the OSAT space, but that position doesn't come cheap uh, uh, or uh, without a lot of effort. Uh, first of all, you have to have outstanding engineers uh, with a lot of diverse backgrounds to come together uh, in, a, in an advanced packaging R&D environment. It really takes years to build that kind of in, uh, engineering team. Uh, we've been doing that for over 50 years now, um, but it's, it's not uh, trivial. Um, you also have, uh, in, in addition to a state-of-the-art R&D center like the one I showed you there at K5, you need localized design services that is 
that are close to the customer. So offices close to the customer where we can sit down and collaborate on their ideas and their visions for the future and what kind of packaging might be required. Um, dedicated assembly lines are very important. Uh, that takes a significant investment uh, so that you can run uh, pilot line uh, packages and make sure that your uh, technology is robust enough to um, ramp into, into high volume as they move into the production lines. Requires a really uh, complete toolbox of engineering services. So uh, tools for simulation, design, characterization, all of these software tools are critical. Uh, to the R&D and uh, they have to be constantly upgraded with new um, uh, revisions. And it really takes a commitment by the customer or by the, by the company um, for continuous uh, innovation. You have to be willing to take on the challenges of the market and be at the leading edge to solve uh, the problems as these new uh, products are uh, imagined and, and brought to the market by our customers. The other important thing in, uh, in packaging and throughout the semiconductor supply chain um, is uh, the supply chain partners that we work with. And this is a Yol slide. I want to give a shout out to, her, uh, to the Yol guys. Thank you for that. Uh, we're a customer of Yol, so we have a lot of their materials and we do use them from time to time. Um, but advanced packaging and advanced packaging development requires a very robust uh, supply chain. Uh, one of the things we're looking at right now is a potential trend that hasn't fully uh, caught on uh, in a broad way, but we are seeing it begin where we're moving from a globalization uh, into localization. Um, that's presenting a lot of uh, new risks as far as um, availability of materials, uh, inventory strategies, um, and how uh, complex products might be. So I wouldn't say this has uh, become a major challenge for us yet, but it's certainly a challenge on the horizon uh, that we're watching uh, and we'll see how this develops over time. So this is my last slide, uh, sort of looking at the future of, of advanced packaging. Um, where do we go from here? What's required? Uh, right now we can already see a number of uh, things that have to be worked on uh, to, to um, uh, solve the, the new uh, challenges coming from uh, new products. Um, Multi-sided assemblies, so we can continue to increase the density in packaging, very important. Uh, new materials for thermal performance and better signal integrity are going to be required. Continuing to develop more electrical microsystems and interconnect technologies, and then extreme density to where we increase the number of IOs in the, in the performance per watt all of these things are, are being worked on now and uh, they will result in uh, ultimately new package configurations. Of course, that takes a lot of capital to do that. And um, the market doesn't want to wait for these things. They, they want them now. Uh, our view is that heterogeneous packaging will help extend Moore's law. You know, if you think about Moore's law, it has two components, the number of transistors and the cost per transistor. transistor. In packaging, you can think about that being the number of IOs in a package and the cost per IO in a package. If we can continue to increase uh, the, num uh, the number of IOs uh, while reducing uh, the cost per IO uh, at the packaging level, we can actually end up extending uh, Moore's law. So packaging is, is contributing greatly uh, to the overall semiconductor market in that way. And uh, we wanna continue to uh, make the developments that are necessary for that. So how do we get to this next level? How do we achieve these milestones? Well, we have to continue to bring in the best and the brightest engineers. Um, we have to invest in the capital required for the next generation packages. Um, uh, a robust uh, supply chain uh, with partners that also are interested in innovation is important. And then continuing to collaborate in the industry like we're doing today in this panel discussion uh, is very important. So thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you today and uh, talk about Amcor's view on packaging. Uh, just a quick commercial message. Um, if you want to learn more about Amcor and more about our packaging solutions, you can visit us at uh, amcor.com and check out our website. And uh, there's uh, a, lot, a lot of material there to look at. So thanks again. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here today. Uh, well, thank you, John. And obviously, Amcor is a leader in this space, uh, clearly. 
Um, I do want to uh, quickly uh, move over to some Q&A. We have some questions that have already come in, but John, if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to follow up uh, with you about um, one of the slides that you mentioned, um, because it's something that we at SIA uh, um, are, are working on or, or, or involved in. You mentioned that supply chain, uh, supply trends are moving from a globalization model to more of a localization model. Um, what do you believe is driving this change um, in, your, in your view? Ooh, okay. That's a good question, Helen. Um, I, th I think there's several things driving that. One is sort of the overall global political climate. We've had a trend toward nationalism over the last four or five years, um, not just in the US, but in, in a lot of countries around the world. That's obvious in, in the US and China. Um, I think the US, uh, the current US administration's uh, trade war on China is creating some risks to the supply chain that people are becoming sensitized to. And then this year, COVID, um, you know, it exposed a lot of risks in the supply chain uh, where certain companies had to lock down uh, due to their government regulations and, uh, and interrupted uh, some of the uh, semiconductor supply. So I think companies have kind of looked at all of those things. Uh, they've looked at their risk mitigation plans, even their disaster plans and said, you know, what do we do to mitigate these risks? Uh, one of the ways of doing that is to become a little more localized, have a little more control over your uh, supply chain. Uh, so those things are being looked at now. Um, SIA uh, is working closely with the US government, I know on uh, more uh, localized uh, semiconductor supply in the US, uh, we support that. Um, we also believe though that it's important to maintain the global supply chain for speed and and cost, but I think those two things can coexist uh, to address, you know, the risks that we're seeing uh, that I've just talked about. Perfect. I appreciate that. Um, on a similar note, uh, Santosh, I wanted to get back to you, uh, talk about supply chains. Um, you had mentioned that there is a trend now for more mobility across the uh, semiconductor supply chain, which I think is quite fascinating. You know, you know, ever since uh, the Fabulous Foundry model was conceived in the 1980s, you know, I think of the industry as, be, as tending more towards specialization, um, less IDMs from, you know, the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and, and more, you know, companies that are just doing one aspect, one stage of production. Um, but now, as you mentioned, it seems like a lot of, a lot of companies are sort of moving and, and sort of broadening out um, their, um, uh, what, what, they're, what they're doing within the, within the supply chain. Um, do you see this change, this trend changing, um, or, or what, 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 what do you, what do you, what do you predict for for how this trend will continue in the future? Well, I, I see, you know, like uh, some of, you know, like the players across the supply chain. Of course, they are, you know, like uh, increasing beyond their traditional domain. And uh, so, one of the good example I gave over is, you know, like the TSMC, for example. You know, it is the one of the largest foundry, and they are, you know, like now very much going into, you know, like the advanced packaging. And advanced packaging is basically, you know, like uh, the vapor level packaging, high-end packaging, because they are, you know, like they don't have to, you know, like uh, completely go into a kind of, you know, like the new domain. It's kind of, you can say, you know, like the extension of their, you know, like uh, the some of the foundry technologies and, you know, so they had, you know, like some of the experience over there, they can leverage some of those equipments also there. So I can see, you know, like where there is some incremental, you know, like kind of investment or, you know, like kind of, that expertise needed, then you know, like the players are going towards that. If it is you no know, like complete new business model, for example, fabulous to foundry, I don't see that thing happening. You know, it's still like the fabulous player. I don't see it going into the manufacturing and all those. But the manufacturing player, for example, the, the substrate makers, you know, so they are you know like doing the making the substrate and they are they work you know like very closely with those ads, and uh, sometimes they have to you know like uh, co-work to solve some of the problems over there. So they already have some of the learnings over there, you know. So if they, you know, like go into, you know, like uh, developing uh, some assembly technologies, advanced packaging technologies, but that is on the basis of, you know, like their, you know, like the strong, strong uh, expertise in the substrate business. So using that substrate, they try to embed some dye into the substrate and using that as a platform that, you know, like try to develop it over it. Another one, just one point. So I, as I mentioned, you know, like the, some of, you know, like the players like Google or, you know, like Alibaba or Facebook. So they are, you know, like now, developing, you know, like the going to the chip design, especially for, you know, like AI for their data centers. So one of the thing is, you know, like that, so the company, they want to control the core technology beyond their, you know, like uh, their main, main product and services, you know. 
so there you know like, they want some kind of control so so that you know like they can much better you know like tune their hardware as well as software they don't have to depend on the third party you know like the chip update or something like that so that's why because of that they're also you know like coming into this yeah. right yeah no, very interesting um uh, john i wanted to uh, there's a number of questions here coming in i wanted to ask one of you um that was uh specific uh, for you um, which has to do with, um, you mentioned the drive to make packages smaller in mobile um, for, you know, added room for, you know, larger batteries, um, which we all understand we are having our phones. Um, um, but uh, the question is, um, what's what, what's the driver behind advanced packaging and automotive? Um, I kind of asked this, I just bought a, a new car and it, I'm, it seems like, uh, you know, there probably are some very interesting specific specific uh, specificities uh, that are needed uh, specifications. Um, for um, um, packaging for chips that go in auto, auto, autos. And as we know today, you know, the, 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 the chip content in automobiles is, is just, you know, growing. It's essentially a, a car is essentially a big computer on wheels now. So do you have any um, so thoughts about what is driving packaging for uh, the automotive end, end use? Yeah, well, I mean, first and foremost, to be a, a package supplier in the automotive industry, you have to have uh, a long-term view. Uh, they require longevity. They do not like change. Um, they want you to, you know, get into a factory site and stay there. Uh, so you really have to be committed to the long term uh, whenever you take on a, an application in automotive. As far as the specific um, uh, package requirements, of course, automo uh, automotive has the highest level of quality and reliability requirements. They really have this uh, zero defect uh, mentality going in uh, to the car. Uh, the new applications are driving, uh, you know, the advanced packaging I talked about. So as we add sensors to the car, uh, we need more MIMS. Uh, cameras are going into the car now. They require uh, packages that have never been in a car before. Um, infotainment, you know, is taking on uh, processors and uh, even putting modems now into cars for connectivity. So uh, devices that have never been in the car before uh, now have to go in and they're going into packages that uh, aren't um, particularly uh, um, have a lot of uh, his history in automotive. So the concerns over reliability for um, you know, mounting a surface mount package in a car, you know, in an in a environment that has a lot of temperature change and, and vibration creates a lot of, um, uh, you know, new uh, challenges for us. Very different environment than putting those packages in a cell phone. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I think that just the technology um, demands uh, by customers are quite fascinating given the variety of environments that, that these chips need to go into. Exactly. Uh, cars or you know miniaturization so um definitely a lot of uh, innovation needed uh in, in this in this back-end activity um we, i see we're coming up to the end of the hour we do have other questions um unfortunately i don't think we're going to be able to get to them all but i do appreciate everyone uh sending in your questions and uh your interest in this topic it is a very fascinating uh and important um, topic um, in terms of both the technology side of things and also um, as we alluded to in some of our Q and A, um, sort of the the policy issues too that are, are that will uh, impact where this work will be done, um, how uh, trends are changing in terms of globalization or localization. So I think um, it'll be important uh, for us at SIA and for uh, you know, uh, analysts who are covering it, such as uh, Santosh and, and Guillaume, as well as folks operating in this industry uh, in this in this segment, such as John, uh, to to you know sort of keep an eye on on how these how these trends develop. So with that, let me go ahead and conclude. Um, I want to thank again, uh, Guillaume Asogba, uh, Santosh Kumar, both of Yol Development, and of course, John Stone of MCOR for a very enlightening and robust uh, uh, discussion uh, for our webinar here. And for all the attendees, again, I want to thank you. I know a number of you have asked about um, presentation slides and uh, recording. Um, we'll be able to get back to you in about 24 hours um, with follow-up on that. So um, with that, let me go ahead and conclude the, the uh, seminar. And again, thank you all to the presenters and have a great day. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Helen. Yeah, have a nice day. Yep. Thank you, Matt.